TEDx. Hello. Nice to see you all today. So my name is Ariel. And I'm here to tell you about a new way to interact with the world. We call it thought-controlled computing. Well, what is thought-controlled computing? It's just what it sounds like. It's the ability to interact with parts of the world using your mind. Now, this might sound like science fiction from a beam-me-up Scotty-type future, but it's real. And myself and my colleagues in labs all over the world are at the first stages of the technology but it's here. It works using a sensor on your forehead that reads your brain waves. Brain waves are the sum total of the neuronal activity inside your head. Your neurons communicate electrically. They send action potentials to one another in grand orchestration. Well, the sum total of that electrical activity are known as your brain waves, and we can read those from outside your head. When you think or engage in anything mental, your brain waves change. Some of those brainwave changes are stable from person to person, and we can use those as control signals. EEG used to use huge, big equipment. If you wanted to do anything cool with EEG, you'd go into a lab or into a hospital, and you'd be hooked up with 128 sensors on your head. And if you wanted to look inside your own mind and discover and unlock its inner workings, or turn on a light just by focusing, you'd have to sit very, very still with a mass of wires to make that happen. Well, I have my EEG in my pocket. This is my Muse. It's a brainwave sensing headband. It's going to change the way we interact with the world. It has sensors on the forehead and behind the ears, two of them, and it slips on just like a pair of glasses. It's so comfortable, you could wear it all day long. It there's something else in my other pocket. You all probably have one, and it's a computer. And it actually knows what's on my mind right now. It's reading my brain waves, or rather, the headband's reading my brain waves, and the data is transmitted to my phone. Let me show you. These are my brain waves right here. I'm going to blink for you. Blink, 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 so that you know that it's live. And then I'm going to show you what you can do with this. So I first started working with the technology about a decade ago in the lab of Dr. Steve Mann back in Toronto. At that point, we'd be doing these concerts where 48 people at a time could interact with music just by thinking. So people would sit in the audience with a brainwave sensor on, and they'd be able to control aspects of the sound, the pitch, the volume, just with their thoughts. So I sat around thinking, you know, we're controlling the world with our mind, and people probably want to know about this. So I got together with my partners, Chris and Trevor, and together we set forward to take this technology out of the lab and into the world. The first thing we did, of course, was create a faithful recreation of the game from the Star Trek version, The Game, which Riker brought back from Risa from the Qatarians, because, of course, we're all geeks. <laughs> we then tried to think of some more practical applications of the technology and wanted to make it very physical. We wanted to make things that you could interact with in real time. This is our levitating chair. When you sit in the chair, and relax, you increase your alpha waves. And that increase in your alpha waves allows the chair to rise. So you're actually levitating it with your mind. And a handy dandy winch in the ceiling. <laughs> then we went on to create more musical applications to so understand how people's creative potentials could be expanded and extended with this technology. And then we sat around thinking, what is the biggest thing we could do with this? Well, it so happened that the Olympics were coming to Canada in 2010. So we created a proposal for the Ontario government indicating that we could change lighting on a bunch of interlocking rings just by thinking. And we asked the proposal to gently be passed over to the Canadian Olympic Secretariat. And a week later, 
got back an email that was really going to change our fates. The Ontario government asked us to create an installation where people in Vancouver could control some really, really big things with their mind. The lighting on, the CN Tower, the Canadian Parliament buildings, and Niagara Falls. And we did it. So this set forward this insane process where we moved our small team to a team of about 25 people, creating a technology that had previously been entirely unproven, working across multiple levels of government, an extraordinarily fixed time frame for the Olympics. Thankfully, it succeeded. And 7,000 people got to individually interact with these icons with their mind. They'd sit in a chair in Ontario House in Vancouver in front of a big 16 by 9 screen that was a porthole to the tower or the falls, wherever on the other side of the country. And they could then, just by focusing on the lighting, be able to interact with it. You'd see people come up and say, you know, call home back to Toronto or Ottawa and say, look at the tower, look at the tower, that's dad doing it, that's dad doing it. So after we did the Olympics, we moved on to understand what else we control with our mind. And we made thought-controlled everything. Thought-controlled slot car machines, thought-controlled toasters, thought-controlled beer taps. <laughs> if you come to our Christmas party, you can try our thought-controlled beer tap, yes. We have boxes of thought-controlled things up in our labs. And then we realized that as fun as it, as it is to control stuff with your mind, there's a much deeper application of this technology. We realized that if you had a system with a human and a computer in the same loop, the computer could know something about the human, and you could create a relationship between the two. This is our responsive room. In the responsive room, the lights, the blinds, and the music all respond to you. As you read, the lighting gets brighter. As you chill out, the music starts to dim. As you fall asleep, the lights turn off and the blinds close. This allows you and technology to be in a relationship with one another. We then realized that if technology was knowing something about you, an even cooler thing could happen. You could know something about you. This is an example of our tech. It's an old version of the headband. He's interacting wirelessly on the tablet. As he focuses on the content, on this little form, it rotates. And the more he focuses, the faster it rotates. He's playing this game entirely with his mind. Now, the cool thing to me is, at the end of the game, you can see what your brain was doing during the entire course of gameplay. This isn't just a leaderboard. This is actually showing you what your mind is up to at every moment. And this is building a better mind. This is really interesting. So we now have the ability to track your brain state throughout the day. What might we learn from this? Well, you could be able to track your productivity at work, see when you were most engaged, and the things that stress you out and cause you to shut down. What would you want to track? The people in your life that make you happy? The triggers that you have for depression? What are the things that if you knew what was going on inside would enable you to live differently? Now, for some people, this technology is enabling. For others, it's absolutely life-saving. For example, you could create a system where an epileptic could be able to monitor his brain state and during a seizure, send that information to his doctor and a text message to a loved one to say that he was in danger. Or if you have a kid with ADD. Kids with ADD have generally heightened levels of theta waves, or dream state, and lowered levels of beta waves, focus state. Simply by playing a game where you're driving a car with your beta waves, kids can improve their ADD symptoms as effectively as Ritalin. This is not just powerful, but it also gives kids choices, the ability to understand what's going on in their own mind and make choices based on that. Or, if you want to meditate, you could slip on a headband and be able to track your meditation state and then get reinforcement to get you into deeper and deeper states. So you could actually sit there and know, is this thing on? Is this meditation working? Or if you want to improve your cognitive abilities, who doesn't? You could track your brain state and then do exercises to improve your working memory, your attention, your ability to respond positively to stress. So these are the kinds of applications, things that let you see inside yourself and use that valuable information to 
discover, and if you so choose, improve the self that we see as the first powerful Im impacts of this technology. Now, it's important for us that this technology is fundamentally human, that it's here to enable those things that make us awesome and human, and possibly to be able to discover new untapped potentials. This was really brought home to me about 10 days ago when I was on the airplane. I was traveling from Toronto to California. And I sat down next to a guy who was disabled. He was missing actions in his limbs and in his arms. I didn't realize that at first, but as I went to sit down, I squished against his arm, and he didn't feel it. It was incredibly awkward. And I went and I sat down next to him, and he looked straight at me and said, I know you. And I said, OK, hi, I'm Ariel. Nice to meet you. How do I know you? We never did find it out, but through the course of conversation, he, of course, discovered what I did. And it came to that inevitable and awkward place where it was clear that I was doing something that was really going to change his life. And he turned to me and said, said the thing that I was almost dreading that he would say because it was so big and so heavy. He said, I can't wait for this to come to life so that it can help me live as I used to. And I, I'm feeling it right now again. Like I started to well up and I burst into tears and I was staring straight ahead. And finally I looked at him and said, I, that's really nice and I'd really love to help you, but I don't know that I can. I mean, I get emails all the time from moms with kids with cerebral palsy or people whose fathers have had a stroke and they want this technology to be able to enable them. And, and I don't know that I can. I mean, it's still really first stage. It's really basic. You can, you can move a, you know, box on a screen, left and right. And he turned to me and said, my background is in visual effects. I created the first video game, Helix, uh, Iron Helix, that was pressed to CD-ROM in the 1970s. I had a stroke, and I can no longer live my life as I used to. Back in the 70s, we had a box on the screen that we could move left or right, and we were thrilled. Today, screens are filled with tens of thousands of boxes moving in brilliant orchestration, so good that it almost approximates life and sometimes even exceeds it. I have no doubt that this technology will get there. Thank you.